All right, so this is integrated service management. Um, and we're talking about the integrated service management concept. We're talking about um, the, uh, okay. Uh, we're talking about the integrated service management concept. We're talking about the fact that all of us uh, probably familiar with ITIL, uh, most of the people on this call anyway would be familiar with ITIL. Um, many are familiar with Lean. Um, and truthfully, when we, we've been doing ITIL for 20 years at uh, Pink Elephant, and when we, when we started this ITIL journey, um, we every very few people were doing it, so it was it was uh, a relatively almost evangelistic discussion where we were saying ITIL is the best thing since sliced bread. This is what you should be doing, and a great number of people did it, and that was great, and we thank you for that. And they're still doing it. Um, when we what, after a number of people had accepted and embraced ITIL and moved forward with ITIL and said, wow, this is really helping us. We didn't really have any kind of um, guidepost as to how this was going to work or anything else. Um, so they would come back to us and say, so I've, I've kind of done ITIL. I mean, we're, we're still working on it, but, but all in all, you know, what's my next big initiative? What should I, what should I be doing? And in those early days, this is back in the early 2000s or something of those nature, um, we didn't really have much of an answer. Uh, I, I'm, I'm confessing to that. We didn't really have much of an answer to that. And since then, we've, we've embraced the, the lean principles because lean really is the uh, solution for a number of elements. It's, it's a solution for um, errors and quality and removing errors from the infrastructure, removing errors from the process. It's a, it's a solution for making the processes much more efficient and for, um, and for cutting time for basically Lean is very focused on time and how things can be improved slash speeded up, both improved and speeded up. Uh, so Lean really is the second step. So if ITIL is the first step, Lean is the second step. Because really ITIL, when you look at it closely, never really talked about it talked about the processes. It talked about providing service and that, that providing services, that services are really a delivery vehicle for value. Um, so what it, what in the end, uh, what ITIL was, was doing was it was really pushing processes. Indeed, we were too. Um, and, and in those processes, we were able to develop an element in many cases of efficiency, incident, and control through change and configuration management. Those were the big control processes. And then we developed an, imp an improvement through problem management and uh, that improved availability and improved things. So what, what about Lean? Well, Lean makes it faster. Lean makes it error-free or moving toward error-free. So it focuses on one of the ITIL concepts, one of the ITIL books, which was continual service improvement. Um, which Gary Case and I, by the way, I never introduced myself. This is George Spaulding. Uh, Gary Case and I co-wrote back in uh, 2007. Um, so improvement was a big part of ITIL, but in many cases, it, it was the book that nobody read. It was the book that that was, by the time they got to operations, they went, okay, that's enough. Uh, I don't need to read continual service improvement. Then, of course, Agile, similar time frame, way back in the the mid '90s uh, was where the agile development movement started, though it was not by that name. It was through um, a, a number of things: Scrum, uh, extreme programming, things of that nature. And really, it wasn't until 2001 when everybody got together, meaning a bunch of very creative and very forward-thinking programmers, got together in a, a ski resort in Utah in 2001 and wrote the Agile Manifesto. And that's where uh, that's where the man that manifesto comes, and we'll we'll talk more about that in detail as we move forward. Um, now that the the today's world, the uh, what we're seeing out there now is that the the narrative that seems to be the popular, the buzzword that seems to be on everyone's lips is DevOps, and DevOps is is quite 
it's simple to understand and, and pretty hard to do. Uh, simple to understand because it's really simply saying, look, there's a, there's a big giant silo called dev and another giant silo called ops, and they're not talking to each other and they don't cooperate and they don't, they don't have the same agenda and they don't have the same focus and they don't have the same goals. Um, so, um, now we have, they have to, they have to collaborate, they have to communicate, they have to cooperate, and they have to have shared goals and shared values. It's kind of sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds very simple. And it's, it's more than that. And of course, obviously it's more than that since we teach two different courses on, on DevOps, uh, the essentials and, and the leader course. And organizational change management then becomes really the, the, the structure around how to do transformation. What is it that, you know, what, what do you have to do in order to transform? We can have lots of conversations about you need to transform things, you need to change, you need to transform, transform, transform. Well, we discover that that's really quite hard. Uh, so what are the actual things you might have to do in order to do that transformation? That's really what this course, Integrated Service Management, is about, which is all of the individual pieces, ITIL, Lean, Agile, Agile Project Management, DevOps, Organizational Change Management, because we, we're not really brilliant, <laughs> I think. We looked and said, what are the, the best people doing? What are the best practitioners out there? What are they doing right now? And it was some, and it lined up with what we thought, what we thought should be done. So it made sense, and uh, so we coined the term integrated service management. And let's see, there we go. So. When you look at just service management, it's a set of specialized organizational capabilities for providing value to customers in the form of services. The services we provide are the delivery vehicles for value. Just remember that. So what's value? First of all, who gets to pick? Who gets to pick value? Who gets to decide what value really is? And the answer, of course, is the customer. And does the, so the customer gets to decide. Anybody else? Nope, just the customer. Okay, so the customer decides what value is, and can they change their mind? Yes, and they often do. Oh, okay, so they can change their mind. Not, not ideal, but okay. Uh, so what are the elements, really, of value? They are three. Quality, let's make it, let's make it work, let's make it right. Speed, let's give it to them fast, which sometimes relates to quality, because if I can't get it in two weeks, it's worthless, those kinds of conversations. And cost, which believe it or not, is actually the least the, of these three. I would focus on cost the least. If you focus on quality, cost will take care of itself, without question. We'll, we won't have rework, we won't have waste. So if we focus on quality, it'll be lower cost. IT is always evolving. There's continual need within IT to keep up with the changing technology organization and the customer bases. And the tech, we can always say technology is evolving. That's true. But what's all, what's really evolving in our world is customer experience and customer expectations. Customers now are, you know, when they go to when they go to Amazon, they develop a certain level of expectation, and that that level of expectation then translates to us. So suddenly it's, hey, where, why can't I just click? Why can't I just do this? Why can't I do that? So that's what the real evolution is, is customer expectation. So um, there's a lot of pushback when you try and make these kinds of changes. Um, and that is, uh, so Edgar says it's asking for a PIN code. Um, Stephanie, if there's any way you could uh, help with that. Um, so anyway, uh, our, our organization too heavily regulated for that to work. That's fine for a new startup, but we have so many legacy systems and processes and legacy people. Yeah, we've implemented systems in the past, but they're so complicated. Nobody bothers. Um, we've tried Agile Lean, doesn't work. I told Agile Lean, it doesn't work. Well, and, and that's, that's not as strange because, and one of the reasons why it doesn't work is because there was zero recognition that ITIL, Agile, and Lean, all of them are individual, in many cases, transformative uh, frameworks. So we had to transform the culture first. And we ignored that and just tried to shove this stuff in. When we do that, it doesn't work. 
We didn't use organizational change management. We didn't use what, what's well known and what's been around for decades, which is how organizations can actually change and, do, and successfully change. How can they do that? So, and that's organizational change management, and it's a it's an accepted discipline. It's well known, et cetera. Okay. So, let's just step back for a quick second and say, well, what if what if IT? What if we do nothing? What if we just keep doing what we're doing right now? What if we keep developing technical debt? which is a very common thing in the world of IT. What if the percentage of the total IT spend that's out there right now um, to keep the lights on keeps going up? What happens? Well, so in other words, let's talk about that IT spend. So I'm old enough and have been around long enough that I was around when we used to calculate that basically it was costing 50% of the total IT budget in order to keep the lights on and keep everything running. Um, and um, and then I was uh, then I watched it and and I literally had to change some slides for when it got to sixty percent because I had to change oh sixty okay sixty forty all right well now I'm changing the slides again it's in the neighborhood of seventy seventy five percent of the total IT spend is just to keep the lights on. The invisible part of IT, the stuff that everyone just assumes we do and assumes that we do and do it well. So therefore, the the issue becomes, um, well, wait a minute. What if we don't intervene in this? What if we don't stop this downward spiral of technical debt, more cost going to with less results and less payoff for the business? What if we don't intervene? Well. You kind of already know the answer, but I'm going to say it so that you've at least heard it. If we don't intervene, if we are at the point where we constantly are cannot meet the demand for services from the business, which always seems to be rising, even if the budget isn't rising, the demand for services are rising. If we don't, if we're not able to do it, if we're not able to step up to the plate, then one of two things will happen. Either IT as we know it in that organization will go away and they will find some, some way to do it that does meet the needs and does solve the problems, um, or the, the organization itself will go away. Really, and I think we're at that point. I think we're at a watershed moment when this really isn't optional. So this integration of service management begins with the what we've known and loved for years, demand, plan, build, run. We've added demand. Uh, and then there's an improvement phase at the bottom, enable and improve. Okay. Now, business value is all about meeting the service, having service that meets the end customer's expectations. ITIL talks about value. This is a slide from ITIL. It talks about it in two forms, functional requirements, which we call utility, which is basically what the service actually does, and non-functional requirements, which we refer to in ITIL as warranty, and that's really the environment as to how the service is delivered. Add those two together, utility plus warranty, you get value. So wait a minute, George, you're saying ITIL has always been pu pushing toward value? Yeah. Uh, what about lean? Yeah. Agile? Yeah. DevOps? Yeah. Organizational change management? Well, whatever the change is, usually it's to increase value, but in, in that way, yes. Do these values within the organization with the customers, does the customer's view of value change over time? Absolutely. Things that were, oh my God, look at how phenomenal that is. I never even dreamed you could do that, become totally commonplace. Now, in the old days, they became commonplace in 10 years. Now they become commonplace in 10 weeks, certainly 10 months. Uh, so in other words, this cycle is moving incredibly fast now as to what was unbelievable and very made me very excited as a customer now is I just expect it. We have to find out who our customer is. Uh, that sounds odd, but it's not. Um, exactly who our customer is. We need customer personas, like the airlines have frequent flyers and then they have regular people. 
the uh, pizza delivery places have frequent flyers, if you will, people who order three pizzas a week, and then they have people like me who order like one pizza a year. So uh, so that there's different kinds of customers. It's not just people who eat pizza or people who fly in planes. There's different kinds of customers. They want different things. They have different definitions of value. That's an important discussion. Okay. Um, now this demand, plan, build, run, and improve. Voila, look at how it translates. Demand becomes strategy, plan becomes design, build becomes transition, run becomes operate, which are the four first four books of Eichel, and then continual service improvement, the fifth book. So it was a very easy, a very easy tran trans um translation really between this concept and ITIL. We're looking for ITIL to be adopted, the basic principles to be adopted by your organization, and then adapted to your specific needs. It's not prescriptive. You basically can pick and choose. You can indeed cherry pick in ITIL. So when we integrate ITIL, we list all of these different elements and different processes in the middle, lots of different processes in the middle and over on the right side. When we add in Agile to this, we're now saying the following stuff. We're saying that instead of pro waterfall project management, which, as you can see, starts with a requirements phase, a plan phase, then we design from those pl that plan, we build from that design, we test that build, and we implement. The, the dilemma is we can only define the scope once at the very beginning in the requirements phase. And the amount of time that a waterfall project may take is something along the lines of six months or nine months or a year or maybe even longer. It's usually quite expensive and all the costs are up front long before you receive value because you don't get any value until you implement. As opposed to the concept of agile project management where we have very short, smaller pieces of a project and we can redefine the scope, the customer can redefine the scope literally uh, at once per piece of the project. If you if you think of it like a little teeny tiny waterfall project that's only four weeks long, you'll start to understand what we're talking about. And that's agile iterations. Um, and, uh, and the concept that there's always a production ready environment at the end of each iteration and you can also um, define, redefine the scope at the end of each iteration as well. That's agile project management, which is not, which is now an accepted way to do projects, and it is much, the projects are more successful when they are smaller, it turns out. More successful, the customer gets more value faster, they always get exactly what they want, uh, they don't have to wait to make changes. There's a line that we like to use which says, the customer knows exactly what they don't want as soon as they see it. So you've got to show them something. Talking about it doesn't solve the problem. You have to show them something before you can get decent feedback. So Scrum is all, in the, in the concept of Agile and Scrum, it is always planned work. So usually it's from two to four weeks. There is no change of the scope within that two to four weeks. Uh, once that's done, we present it uh, using a sprint review to the customer and we start to get some feedback. And that's the way Agile and Scrum work. Scrum is basically an, an Agile variant, a methodology that's applied to the Agile framework. Okay, can I integrate that into my demand, plan, build, run? Sure, it's the plan and build section. Very straightforward. Part of this is also uh, visual management, which we we, call, we pull from lean with the visual management examples called Kanban, where we put every single task on a board and we, we know what status that task is in. And it's the whole idea behind visual management, sounds ridiculous, is that it's visual. You could do the same thing, uh, typing it in a text file, and it just wouldn't have the, or putting it in a report, or even putting it in a very complex dashboard. What we're really trying to do is make this simple for people to see color coding, big colors, things like that. Um, so can we do continual improvement in this world of lean? Of course. Uh, basically, that's called Kaizen. Kaizen is a Japanese word that means change for the better. 
And we're talking now about the basic concept of incremental improvement. Incremental improvement is an important concept uh, within, within Lean Kaizen. It's not that we need big, giant improvements. It's not that it's a big bang concept. It's not that we have to throw everything out. That's not the way it works. Uh, so instead, it's basically uh, incremental, just improve a little bit, improve a little bit more, improve a little bit more, just never stop. So the belief in lean is that you can actually pursue perfection, that there could actually be something that's perfect. I think we most of us say, no, nah, no, nah, that's, really, that's not really happening. But in the lean world, while uh, there's a great quote from Vince Lombardi, which I'm going to get wrong, which says, pursuing perfection is definitely impossible, but while pursuing perfection, you just might catch excellence. And I think that's a great quote. So I'm sure I got it wrong, but it's close. Okay, now, so what cycle, what process, what do you use during this, this improvement cycle in Kaizen? You use the Demaic cycle, which comes out of uh, Six Sigma. And it really gives us a nice clear way to do an improvement and improving an existing process or improving something that we can demonstrate is is wrong, uh, that we need to deal with it, we need to and, and focus in, de define it very narrowly, focus in on it, measure, gain data, analyze it, and then act, improve it, actually do something to improve it, and then control it and try and embed it within the organization so that it doesn't go back, slide back, because that does happen a lot when you, um, when you do an improvement. We use another lean tool called a value stream map, which is very visual. This is on a wall. You put this on a wall, and it gives us each individual step of the value stream. Now, we, you and I might call that a process, but in lean, it turns out the value stream is actually way at the beginning and all the way to the far ends. What do you mean the beginning? Well, uh, let's pick a change. Okay, so as soon as somebody says, I'd like to make a change and enters something in a system, uh, you know, an RFC in a system, that's the beginning of the value stream. Now, that may involve multiple processes. It may involve multiple silos of people who get involved. What if there's a third a third party provider, managed service provider in here? They're all part of the value stream because the value stream doesn't end until the customer, whoever started this, whoever requested it, gets it and actually receives value and the value is actually delivered and they're actually using it. So whether it's an order or whether it's a change or whether it's an incident in our world, Basically, the value stream is, and in, in Lean, from the very, very beginning of the process to the, uh, basically when the customer says, I think this is, needs to happen, to the customer now has it in their hand, they are using it, they, they've received it, they've gotten it, it's fixed, whatever, and they, are, they have gained the value. That may involve many, many processes, lots of silos, could involve other uh, people, other parties. That's what a value stream is in the world of, of Lean. And when you can make it visual and put it on a wall, suddenly it becomes really obvious where the waste is. And that's what that WT is. That's basically waste, waiting time. And that translates to waste. So when we look at this, we see, we see how much time it actually takes to do all this for real. And then we say, why does it take that long? And it's not, it's not rocket science. Anybody can look at it and say, wow, that seems to take an awfully long time. Why is that? And here, uh, I'm not going through these, but here are the eight elements of waste in lean. And the number one is at the very top, waiting time. Other types of loss in lean are MURA or variance, variability, doing things different ways. Well, this department does it like this. This department does it this way. This department does it that way. This other department does it that way. That's called waste. That's waste. Uh, why aren't we doing it at the same time, all the same way? Why don't we all use the same process? Why don't we all use the same tool? You, it, it's obvious to you that that's better. You know it. You know that that's better. You've probably fought for it and been for some reason, well, that's not the way we do it, or we don't like that, or that tool isn't going to work for us, or because 
They don't want to. So the idea is that that variability is, is cost. There's no question that doing things different ways is costly, wasteful, and therefore, if we were looking all the way back to value, quality, speed, cost, we're adding to the cost by adding to the variability. And then overburdening and inflexibility. So if you can do 20 incidents a day, you're on the help desk, you can do 20 incidents a day, uh, great. Okay, here's 25. Yeah, but I can only do 20. Here's 30. Here's 35. And I want you to get them done. Okay, if I'm going to get 35 done and really I can only do 20 well, what do you think is going to happen to the 35? Well, I'm going to do them badly. I'm going to give them short shrift. I'm going to, my brain's going to start frying. I'm going to burn out. I'm going to quit. I'm going to make mistakes. This is pretty normal stuff. You know it already. But that's part of waste. It's part of loss in the world of lean. Okay, when we get to DevOps, Pink Elephant has a pretty unique view of DevOps. We believe that it actually is three layers. And the bottom and, quite frankly, most important layer is culture. So we call those three layers the full stack. And so we have, it's culture, practices, and automation. Culture has to be set up right, has to be in place, or DevOps doesn't have a prayer. Quite frankly, neither will Agile, neither will Lean because everyone will keep doing it the same way, and that's not the way we want. If we were going to do it the same way, why would we intervene? All right, in the world of DevOps, we're talking about sharing. We're talking about sharing priorities between Dev and Ops. And by the way, let's add a third circle, security. Add another one, compliance. Add another one, the business. So in other words, DevOps really is misnamed as far as I'm concerned. It should be, this is the way we're going to do IT today. And I don't think it's optional. I don't think it's optional at all that we change. I think we have to intervene, and we have to do it now. We have to do it soon. If not, we're going to just keep going down this same technical debt downward spiral. So shared priorities, shared goals, shared processes, shared knowledge, shared feedback, shared tools, shared success, shared failure, and shared accountability. We're switching to a, a totally to an, a team environment. So we're talking about cross-functional teams, people with dev, people with ops, people with security, all on the same team. That cross-functional team needs to include those disciplines, skill levels, different domain knowledge. Seeking diversity, I want to point that out, because I think most of us, when I hear the word diversity, I think, okay, we're going to have, um, we're going to have people of this race and this race and this race and this race. So uh, you're going to have white, black, brown, yellow people. Well. No, it's also, yes, that's all true, and yes, all different religions, but the one that I feel the strongest about is that I think that teams benefit greatly when there are women on the team. Um, we're in a fairly male-dominated uh, industry, and I do think that women bring a, a very clear, different perspective, especially in terms of the working together aspect. So when we look at DevOps, one of the elements we're talking about, of course, is always automation. And that's, I think it's important for you to understand that I believe that's the last step. I believe that's a maturity, it's almost like a maturity scale. I believe that automation really is what, um, what we're aspiring to, but in many cases, we might not get there very soon. So starting off with this automation goal, that's fine, but the worst thing you can do is start off by buying a tool and saying, oh, I'm going to buy some DevOps tools, and then we're going, that's DevOps. No, that's not DevOps. DevOps, when we, we talk about DevOps in terms, in, at Pink, we talk about 15 essential practices that are necessary to, for you to be good at in order to enable DevOps in the organization. Here we're talking about putting quality first. What do you mean? Well, because see the green line that's going up at an angle? That's basically the way we're used to seeing new products. That's the way we're used to seeing products uh, go in, which is we start off with a certain level of quality and a certain level of features, and then we fix the bugs, and then we fix the features, and then we keep going up, we keep going up a little more, keep going up a little bit more. Over time, we end up with a fairly decent product. It's and the easiest way to describe it is, you know, Microsoft comes out with a new operating system. It's going to be Windows 12. Are you going to you know, now adopt that in the entire enterprise, or are you going to wait? You're going to wait. Okay, so what if you did a different deal? What if you said, 
quality is my absolute, I will never ship something that isn't of the highest quality. Great, that's the line across the top. Okay, what's the trade-off? Features. So I'm going to I'm going to give you something that doesn't break that always works but right now it doesn't have this feature this feature this feature okay and when I add those features they're also going to be perfect they're also going to work we're not going to have to worry about bug fixes you're going to know what works you're going to know what's there and there's not going to be rework there's not going to be all this pushback when you do get to the point in the world of DevOps where you're automating there are literally hundreds of tools out there and in the world of DevOps, rather than buy a single integrated system, what the DevOps world is doing is they're doing best of breed systems that are interoperable. So best of breed individual products for individual steps in the deployment pipeline that actually work together through APIs. In the world of DevOps, it presupposes that the world is going to be virtual and the world is going to be digital. So therefore, we're talking about the cloud. We're talking about infrastructure as a service, talking about storage as a service. We're talking about everything as a service. That's kind of a prereq to do true, super fast, 100 deploys a day DevOps. Everything is code. And we're going to talk about changing the structure of IT. We're going to talk about doing cross-functional teams, but we're also going to talk about literally changing the way we currently do IT, where the dev, the dev team becomes product teams. And on those product teams, there's going to be some ops expertise. There's going to be some security expertise. Then the ops people tend to become platform teams. That basically says we've got a platform. It's going to be rock solid. It's never going to break. And you're going to be able to, product team, install or release onto that whenever you want. Woo! That's kind of a different world. Um, and that's all then going to be part of the world uh, of this integrated service management conversation. The organizational change management conversation simply basically looks like this. Everybody is the one who's going to change. When you say we're going to make a change, it's the people who are changing, not some department. It's people. People need to be addressed in this conversation. Change can threaten uh, an unconscious organizational culture and be rejected. So these are most people, uh, when you say change is a great thing, let's change, it's not always the way it works. Uh, people naturally resist uh, transformational change, large organizational change. It's something can, that can be predicted. It can be planned for. It can be addressed. It's not rocket science that there's going to be resistance. It may be a surprise to the higher-ups, but it's not rocket science. Okay, change can cause anxiety, uh, and uh, there's a certain kind of anxiety. I don't, I can't learn the new stuff. I'm scared of learning new stuff. It's been a long time since so I went to school, and maybe I'll lose my job. If I can't learn it, I can't get good at it, what are they going to do? All of that is possible. You end up managing the transition, which is people. Not the actual change, which is the thing you want to do, but you end up managing the people because they're the things that change. All right. Uh, models for these change come from these three people right here. Okay. It begins uh, with what we talked about. begins with this definition of value. It begins with demand, plan, build, run, and improvement. Um, moves on through this ITIL framework. Uh, and the ITIL framework has a lot of processes involved in it. It also adopts the lean voice of the customer, uh, moves into this concept of agile, agile project management, agile development, agile scrum, and visual management, because, which is really part of both lean and agile. Uh, it becomes part of it, making work visible. We work on continual improvement, which is really a key part of all of it of every one of these integrated service management frameworks. Uh, and finally, that can lead us to this world of DevOps. Uh, in our surrounded, if you will, um, in a climate of correct organizational change management. Okay, I am, I am definitely over time, 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Yes, the slides will be available. 
Um, and uh, I think that you will be contacted because all of you had to give us your all of you had to give us your uh, email address, so you'll be contacted by email to tell you how to get the slides. All right, thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate your participation. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.